Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Take One. Today, I am joined by Karsten Wall, a Winnipeg-based editor who directed a TV series called The Seven Wonders of Manitoba, which won a Golden Sheaf Award at the 2020 Yorkton Film Festival. And most recently, he directed the short film Modern Goose. Modern Goose just screened at the Toronto International Film Festival and will soon screen at this year's Vancouver International Film Festival. Carson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Hell yeah. And the second thing I'll say is correlations. You made a short film unlike any I've seen before. The cinematography is outstanding. The editing is on point. And you can really see the work and effort you put into this film. So once again, congratulations. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Cool. Okay, so let's jump right into the interview with the first question. Um, I thought we should start this off with an introductory question. And the question is, can you tell us a bit about Modern Goose? What is this project and what makes it so special? Um, Modern Goose is uh, my for my second director credit, and but the first real kind of short film I, I I put any I the first real short film that I I uh, have directed and shot, and um, it's basically a experimental ish documentary about urban Canada geese and the challenges they face in the city. It, um, specifically the city of Winnipeg, and it's uh, unnarrated, so that sets it apart from a lot of natural history documentaries, and there is uh, a little bit of an experimental artistic touch to the editing and the story structure, and it's open to interpretation, a lot of it, because there's no narration, and it's really been really rewarding to see people get different uh different messages and different emotions from it than I initially had intentioned. That's awesome. You summed it up beautifully. Uh, yeah, that is something that I would definitely like to highlight is, you know, just how unconventional this movie is. Uh, it is a movie that, you know, in my opinion, doesn't spoon feed you an interpretation. And, you know, it, it lets the viewer freely to make up their mind and, you know, interpret whatever they have to interpret. Uh, as you mentioned, there's no narration. There's no voice of God telling you how to feel. Uh, and it is very open to interpretation, which, you know, brings me to my next point, which is I've been reading reviews online for Modern Goose, and it's been very fascinating to see the different ways in which people are interpreting it. Uh, and I've seen people describing it as, you know, both hopeless and hopeful, both pessimistic and optimistic. And I guess you already answered this question kind of uh, previously, but, you know, uh, I'll ask it once again is... How do you feel about these different interpretations and what do you want viewers to take away from watching this film? Yeah, I like it that it's open to interpretation because um, one of my problems with uh, natural history documentaries, which I don't like, they're, they're great, uh, they have their place, but one of the things that I wanted to stray away from was kind of our projection on, of ourselves onto the animals that we, that we have as subjects of these films. And and uh, trying to kind of read their emotions when we really don't know a whole, like we know animals have very complex emotions, but we obviously can't read their mind. So, I mean, I'm not the first to do this. There's been a, there's been a string of documentaries lately that have taken this approach and it's finding different ways to take this approach. And, and some of them lean heavily on music to guide the emotion and some, some of them strip out the music entirely. So, it is a pretty interesting experiment in and the end end goal is really to just have a deeper connection with the animal the audience with the animal and especially in this film because they're facing some issues with ur with urban environments that you know in in a in a similar way humans may understand in some ways there's there's a little bit of a bridge that I'm trying to connect and uh also with also, but instead of that bridge, I also want to create a, a uh, wider perspective of urban environments, conflict with nature. And uh, I don't want it to be hopeless. Obviously, there's no point, like, it's pretty easy to make people hopeless, especially with environmental or nature films. And that's not my goal to do that. Um, the end of the film, I hope, does bring hope and a message of nature kind of being able to take care of itself despite all the things we throw at it it still runs on its own its own purpose it has its own plan and uh that's something that the geese trust in that 
in nature's plan and is something that maybe we should consider also. Yeah, that's definitely fascinating. Um, I will say you succeeded because, yeah, when I was watching the film, I definitely noticed that the movie very much walks the fine line between, you know, pessimism and optimism. Uh, and there are several scenes, very striking scenes throughout the movie that made me feel, you know, very pessimistic, very hopeless. Like, you know, the scenes where we see uh, the geese eating the bread, which, you know, I, I have I had no idea. I don't really know that much about geese, but I did some research afterwards. And, you know, lo and behold, you shouldn't feed geese bread. And, you know, it's not healthy for them to eat the bread. Um, so scenes like that really, you know, filled me with a certain pessimism. But then, you know, the beautiful shots that bookend the movie, you know, at the very beginning and at the very end, you know, the shots of the beautiful sunsets and the geese resting in the water and, you know, the very majestic close-ups of the feathers and their beaks and their eyes at the very beginning. And then, you know, the final shots where, you know, the geese are flying in slow, in slow motion behind the sunset. That's just, ah, gorgeous. And, it does, it did give me a sense of hope at the end, you know, a hope for, for new beginnings, for, you know, to quote Jurassic Park, you know, for life to find a way, I guess. Uh, and yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely think you succeeded. You walked that fine line beautifully. And, uh, you know, speaking of all of those very striking visuals and all of those very striking moments, that brings me to my next question, which is, you know, the movie ends with a title card stating that you observed and photographed geese for 18 months in order to make this movie. What inspired you to do this? And <laughs> what inspired you to make this film? And I guess a subsequent question would be, out of all animals, why did you pick geese? Yeah, it's it's not a super interesting answer, but basically uh, my first nature series that you mentioned, The Seven Wonders of Manitoba, was pretty standard uh, formulaic. And I wanted to do something a little different, a little higher budget, but I knew I wasn't going to get, let's say a planet earth budget or a, a budget to go up north and film polar bears or caribou. So that limited my scope to animals that I can easily access, uh, in my backyard. And it basically made me narrow down different urban animals. Uh, I started with pigeons and, uh, I started just trying to, when I was making the the pitch for the film, I would walk to the areas of Winnipeg where pigeons like to eat. They eat grain from the grain trains that go by. And uh, I noticed a bunch of geese kind of like fighting them for the grain. And I was like, well, this is kind of interesting because these, the geese, they leave and they come back. But they do, even though that they, they migrate in Winnipeg, they still are pretty much, they have a lot of, uh, adaptations to this environment and it made it once I kind of just started thinking about them as my subject and doing some research I started to realize that they kind of represent a very interesting time in the natural world versus the human world right now where we've created these very manicured environments like the suburbs that we've littered with green spaces and water to make, to make urban life more tolerable for ourselves. And in return, we have all kinds of animals moving in because it's the, it's a perfect environment, environment for them too. And, and, uh, realizing that and realizing that the clash between the, the geese's instinct versus their, versus the convenience of habituating and, but also the dangers of habituating, um, to the urban world that uh, it had a lot of layers of meaning that I wanted to explore. And, and, uh, I'm still planning to make a film about pigeons, but that's, it's a di totally different, <laughs> it's a totally different uh, project. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. Um, you know, just a little side note, a little side story, I guess. Uh, I'm not familiar with geese, as I mentioned, I'm from Colombia, from South America. So, you know, geese don't frequent my country, I guess. Uh, that said, I do have a couple of friends here in Canada who are from Manitoba. So, you know, as soon as I heard about your short film and as soon as I watched it, you know, I reached out to them and I told them like, hey, I'm going to be interviewing this filmmaker from Manitoba who made a short film about geese. And <laughs> their first reaction from both of them was, why? <laughs> geese are scary, angry, and you should keep away from them. You know, you should keep your distance, I guess. So, you know, I thought that was pretty funny, but... uh you know, I, I definitely think you 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 were able to capture them very up close. You know, everything I've heard from geese is very negative, and the fact that you were able to get so close and personal to many of them, amazing. 
Well, they're they're a very polarizing animal, and uh, most people do have a a bit of a fear of them because they've been mis there's some misconception about their territorial nature and but then we also have uh, a lot of migration uh, bird viewing events here in Manitoba, which is it's quite spectacular to see them all migrate at the same time. So we kind of have this love hate relationship with them, which which also has a lot of layers about how we view wildlife. It's if it's inconvenient for us, we hate them. But if it's cute and cuddly and and looks beautiful, then we love them. And that's not really those boxes. The, the nature doesn't really fit into to those boxes all the time. So amazing. Um, okay, that brings me to my next question, which is, you know, how did you craft the story of modern goose? You know, was this story something that you planned beforehand? Was it something that you molded while you were shooting? You know, you molded it by the geese and their actions while you were filming them? Or was the story something that just came to you while you were editing the film? No, I definitely had a uh, a, a guide for my storyline in place because I, start, I realized early on I could just film the geese and they would do nothing but eat and poop. And that's all my footage would be. <laughs> because <laughs> that's, that's literally what they do for most of their, their day. Sounds um, like a great documentary, the <laughs> sequel mayhaps. So I started to think about kind of how they interact with different areas of town, the suburbs versus the downtown versus the wetlands outside of the city and uh, kind of their journey through the city and then kind of putting that against a, bee, a, a small bee story of water and the environment and how water f- flows and gets polluted and it's it run runs off from the suburbs to the river downtown um just and and then as soon as i had i kind of had so i picked out the kind of neighborhoods or the areas of town i wanted to focus on and then there was a lot of sitting around waiting for the geese to do something but it, i did capture um early on the bread sequence you mentioned and that was a very strange i didn't know why there was bread by the by the river there i didn't know really what was going on but i knew it was a it was a scene that a lot was happening and when that was it was good to get that early on because it it was easy to to create a storyline on both ends of that and be like okay this is probably the the three-fourths um part the i don't know i don't know about climax but it's like it's an important turning important point in the film so i'm going to build off of it and then that was helpful although the storyline my first assembly was two hours long. There was a lot more going on in my head um, and a lot more characters, human characters, and uh, a lot more stuff happened. So uh, the NFB was really helpful in giving me these hard uh, time limits and, and giving me notes on you know certain things overstayed their welcome in the film that it's, sometimes it's hard for a director to see those things. And uh, process of elimination, but keeping this the same arc, the arc pretty much stayed more or less the same. Also with the beginning and end, the bookend, that was something that I I knew I wanted early on. And the the magnetic field that the geese visualized, that visual effect that I have in there, that was another thing I knew I wanted early on. So that also helped. So I had the beginning and end and then a middle part. So I it's easy it's kind of like a I always approach editing as like a puzzle where you start with the end pieces, but you also start with some of the middle that you know uh, exists. Like if you're doing like a jigsaw puzzle, you see the sky part or whatever, like, or all one color. It's kind of how I approach editing where I know some things will work and then I build and try to complement them on either ends. And uh, I can do that because I was filming also. I could edit, film, edit, film, and and make sure that um, I'm not missing any pieces. So I was like filming right up to the end of the edit. So, I mean, yeah, that was extremely insightful. Thank you so much. (laughs) I mean, as as, as someone who's, you know, dabbling with filmmaking myself, you know, I've I've made a couple of short films. Uh, I haven't tried my hands at documentary filmmaking, but, you know, it is it is definitely something that is itching in my head. And this was extremely helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and okay, that brings me to my next question, which is, you know, more related to editing. 
And, you know, uh, before you directed these different documentaries, you were an editor for several nature documentaries. You know, you edited for Polar Bear Town, March of the Polar Bears, Great Lakes Untamed, and, you know, many, many more. And my question now is, how did this editing background inform your filmmaking when making Modern Goose? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was kind of, in some ways, uh, it hindered me a little bit because I was kind of stuck i've i've worked mostly in television and there's a really there's a really structured act uh like act by act work process that you do and you always have a cliffhanger at the end of an act it's it's the old tv uh it's the old tv format and i really i really needed to break out of that mindset it actually was quite difficult to break out of that mindset um but my Seven Wonders of Manitoba project did teach me that, you know, you got to shoot a ton in any nature film. You got to shoot lots, but you also have to really organize that footage because if you shoot something great and it gets lost in the mountain of footage that you got, it's almost like you never shot it at all. So a lot of my time in the edit suite was going through every single shot and flagging and logging uh the ones and the potential they had for scenes and I had to do, do that multiple times and I had like 10 I have like 20 terabytes of footage or, or 30 I don't I don't even know how much I had I had an insane amount of footage I mean I shot a lot of slow-mo so it wasn't like it was a lot bigger than it should have been but there was a ton of footage that in any editing project I take on I need to know the footage like the back of my hand because right up until the end you will remember a shot excuse me right up until the end you will remember a shot uh, that you need to have cataloged in your brain and then you need to have it easily accessed in the database and uh so that that really helped me my my uh a lot i've, I've made a lot of mistakes in my editing career as far as losing footage and get, getting lost in my own footage so it was helpful in a hindrance yeah, trying to break out of that rigid format and do something a little more artistic. I, I really struggled with that. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, I guess the next question I have would be, you know, your film has been described in a variety of different ways. You know, the NFB website described as a, describes it as a film essay or as a nature film, but the CBC and TIV describe it as a documentary. Would you describe Modern Goose as a documentary? Yeah, I think I would because it is not like I take some liberties with with some visual effects and stuff, but for ninety nine percent of it is stuff I captured in the field and my experience with nature documentaries. I do know that nothing ever, especially with nature films, nothing plays out how it like some of it plays out how it really went. But you will do a lot of you'll take a lot of liberties in editing different animals together. Like when I work on polar bear documentaries, they're definitely cutting between different even male and female polar bears trying to say it's the same polar bear so like it's a thing with nature films it's just so hard to that to to an animal's not an actor so it, it, to create a storyline sometimes can be a challenge so i would say it is a documentary a natural history documentary um some parts maybe a little more authentic than a regular natural history documentary and some parts a little more artistic and uh, unconventional but definitely it's all based in reality hell yeah no i mean i agree um actually when i you know when i was writing this question i was reminded of a class i took here in university at ubc uh that was a seminar in documentary filmmaking and you know one of the big documentarians that we studied was you know john grierson who coincidentally is also the founder of the nfb and, you know, in 1939, when he founded the NFB, he he described documentaries as the creative treatment of actuality. And, you know, I think your film definitely fits into that mold. And you definitely treated actuality in a very creative way. So I would definitely thank you. agree. It's a really and, nice compliment. Oh, um, <laughs> thank you. You made an amazing film and you let me watch it and interview you. So thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, OK, OK. Uh, that I think we're uh, kind of running out of time. So, you know, let's go through the last few questions. Um, the penultimate question that I have for you is, 
you know, speaking of the creation of the NFB, in 1939, the National Film Board of Canada was established with the mandate, Interpret Canada to Canadians and the World. Modern Goose, as you've mentioned, was produced by the National Film Board of Canada, the NFB. So my question to you is, how does Modern Goose interpret Canada to Canadians and the world? And more specifically, how does it interpret Winnipeg in particular to Canadians and the world? Yeah, I'll try to answer this quickly. Um, I mean, the fact that it is a Canada, the species is the Canada Goose, and uh, they, they're, the history of the Canada Goose is not stated in the film, but there's underlying undercurrents of it that they were in the 1950s, they were hunted almost to extinction. And then in the 1970s, we started creating the suburbs and it happened to be the perfect environment for them to flourish. So now we have a quote unquote population problem with them um, and take measures to limit their population. So in a lot of ways, it mirrors our second half of the 20th century. Uh, just the story of the geese. It, well, does yeah, it kind of has some very uh, subtle uh, similarities to Canada's experience with the wilderness, and kind of in a in a, an emotional, in a deeper way, it, it kind of does expose our contradictory relationship to the natural world here in Canada, where we we like the natural world world to be convenient for us, and we extract an immense amount of wealth from it, but we also a little hypocritically say that we have this vast untouched wilderness that, um, like, you know, the, all of our, a lot of our iconography is, you know, mountains and, and rivers and the wild North and stuff like that. When reality, we really, we really have this dual relationship with nature that, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff there um, that I can't really fully get into, but I feel like the geese is just a small example of that. And Winnipeg specifically, I mean, Winnipeg fits in with other prairie cities such as Saskatoon, Regina, Calgary, Edmonton, um, in the fact that they they are surrounded by farmland and they really let suburbia take over and and really take over the city in a lot of ways and i've seen some reviews that say i this film was great but i really don't want to i really don't want to visit winnipeg i didn't mean to do that but it is the nature of prairie cities where we create these really really in my opinion ugly ugly suburbs and they're kind of an affront to nature where we have like fake fountains and fake and and golf courses and to me, it, I hate it, and I wanted to expose it, expose the ugliness of it, and I didn't have to try too hard because it is pretty damn ugly on the outskirts of any of these towns. Sorry to people in the suburbs, but that's just how I feel about that. Um, but I didn't, I didn't set out to make Winnipeg look bad. I thought some parts of it looked beautiful, but I mean, the main goal for me was to have the wetlands environment shine through because that's another. With these prairie cities, that's another thing that I wanted to touch on is that we do just bulldoze so many beautiful wetlands that are so important to cleaning the environment and cleaning the water. And then we replace them with really kind of just flood management, especially in Winnipeg we, with these these ditches and, and irrigation. And uh, then what we have is this really polluted water system uh, that Lake Winnipeg is got a huge pollution problem that could be solved by the protection of wetlands. So I wanted to focus and try to show some of the beauty of the wetlands and how important they are and how nature is really like, if you want to experience nature in, in one of its purest forms, I, going to a wetland preserve is one of the best ways, I think. Mm, that's amazing. Thank you. Great answer. Uh, okay, real quick, the last question I have for you is a question that I usually ask, you know, the different interviewees that come on the show. Uh, it is a more personal question, but the question is, what is your favorite film? And if you don't have a favorite film, what is the first one that comes to mind? I mean, I don't have a favorite film, but I do really like um, the documentary eras of the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, NFB has two really amazing documentaries from... I would consider that era, and one is called 
Carts of Darkness, and the other one is called Weebo's War. And I know you can watch Carts of Darkness on YouTube. I think Weebo's War you have to purchase to watch, but both are very good films and very good examples of of really well crafted documentaries. The reason why I like that era of documentary filmmaking is because the filmmakers really dedicated years and years and years to their subjects and just were extremely patient to let the stories unfold and the characters develop. And I feel like in the era of quick, fast YouTube documentaries, that is completely lost, mostly lost. And uh, it's a shame. But the nice thing is organizations like the NFB preserve these films and preserve these moments in Canadian film history and you can go back and watch them. Agreed. No, that is awesome. Thank you so much for the recommendations. I'll definitely add them to the watch list. Uh, okay, uh, the interview has come to an end. So Carson, once again, thank you so much for joining us for this interview. Uh, you know, to the viewers at home who are watching this right now, definitely check out Modern Goose either at this year's Vancouver International Film Festival or somewhere down the line whenever it becomes available. Once again, thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for joining us, Carson. Thanks so much. Ooh.